I think we can start. We can start? Yeah. Okay, I would like to uh, say uh, good morning, good day, good evening to everyone uh, uh, here in the room and also online. Uh, this session is uh, entitled Disability, Gender and Digital Self-Determination. What's a missing link? And uh, this is um, the session on digit, uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Gender. So we are delighted to have a number of excellent speakers from different parts of the world who will be joining us online. And also uh, there's a speaker here uh, on site. And so I will pass on to um, the, uh, the organizer of this particular uh, session, Deborati Das, uh, Point of View, um, and also uh, the person uh, responsible for the Dynamic Coalition on Gender. So please, um, I wish Deborati was here in person, but uh, welcome Deborati uh, online. And uh, Deborati will give us a context uh, for this particular uh, session and, um, and introduce um, uh, a little bit more about the topic. So thank you, Deborati. All right, while we're waiting for some of the online panelists to join us, um, I will, um, uh, I will, uh, well, there's, an, there's the concept of digital self-determination and, uh, and that's what the framing of this particular session is all about. And uh, it relates to um, our, our digital footprints and we know how much they are growing. And society is grappling with new concepts, experiences, and understandings of the relationships between our lives and the technologies that we use. And who are we as digital beings? Are we able to determine ourselves in a data-driven society? How do we locate ourselves as empowered data subjects in the digital age? How do we reimagine human autonomy, agency, and sovereignty in the age of datafication? Self-determination has been a foundational concept related to human existence, with distinct yet overlapping cultural, social, psychological, philosophical understandings built over time. Similarly, digital self-determination, DSD for short, is a complex notion reshaping what we understand as self-determination itself. DSD fundamentally affirms that the person's data is an extension of themselves in cyberspace, and we need to consider how individuals and communities can have autonomy over our digital selves. So this panel session will center on the intersectional feminist perspectives with women, queer and trans persons with disabilities and experts working in the intersections of digital rights, gender, accessibility and technology. We will explore the idea of DSD through the lens of gender and lived experiences of persons with disability. So this is drawing from a first of its kind series of DSD studios organized by Point of View. And Point of View is the organization in India um, headed by, uh, well, um, the, the project is uh, involved with, um, with this particular topic and headed by Deborati Das. And it's been done in four cities in India. And the panel will focus on the theme of digital divides and inclusion. 
and also delve into the ability of women, gender, and sexual minorities living with disabilities to digitally self-determine themselves using current emerging digital technologies based on lived realities of individuals from different geographies and contexts. And secondly, it will deepen understandings of the need and potential to work with persons with disabilities in developing new and emerging technologies. Thirdly, it, it explores the collaborative and learning opportunities to make DSD actionable and a reality for women, queer and trans persons living with disabilities. So we are going to look through the lens of gender, sexuality and disability um, and explore a bridge between access points and so-called pain points and think of inclusive ways of determining the self in new digital life spaces, going beyond accessibility and also thinking about personhood, agency, choice, autonomy, rights and freedoms in digital spaces for persons with disabilities. We will draw from our experience of DSD studios and its outcomes, articulate an exploration of a root concept of DSD and its key components through the lens of disabilities and gender. We'll think about how we can co-create DSD through theory, practice, lived experiences and concrete examples. And finally, operationalize DSD via a set of core principles and policy recommendations centering the intersections of gender and disability. So we are still waiting for the online speakers. Uh, so I will, I will pass on now to um, Vidya, uh, who is here with me, uh, and ask Vidya a little bit about uh, your experiences of, digital, of, of being a digital person online and any barriers and enabling factors around this thing about accessibility, autonomy, choice, and potentially uh, what, what are the implications um, for a woman with a disability. But before I do that, I will introduce Vidya, um, who is from an organization in India called Vision Empower. And Vidya is a co-founder uh, Vision Empower is a non-profit enterprise incubated at IIITB in Bangalore to bring education in science and mathematics to students with visual impairment. She's a research fellow at Microsoft Research India and has authored several papers on issues concerning people with vision impairment such as improving programming environment accessibility for visually impaired developers. Vidya has received numerous awards and scholarships such as Thai Aspire Young Achievers Awards, Reebok Fit to Fight Award, and the Dibirai Ambani Scholarship for Academic Excellence, and many more. So please, I'll pass now over to Vidya, so uh, I look forward to hearing your particular uh, experiences. Please go ahead, I'll turn it on. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for having me here and also to Gunella. Um, yes, we make STEM education accessible for children with visual impairments and I am born blind. So I have experience of growing up um, in India, in, which is uh, one of the developing countries. And also I have experiences uh, of uh, going online, the digital space as a blind person. As well as I am a um, woman with a disability, so I have that experience as well. So today I'll be talking more from a lived experience um, perspective and also by, I'll also be sharing some of the observations that I've had with the children as well as women with disabilities from my friend circles and uh, things that people talk about generally online. Um, so firstly, digital space, when we talk about it, it is, it is really huge. Um, because whenever we say technology, that's the only way as a blind person I can 
i can communicate with the world i can be more efficient it has opened up so many opportunities like never before um by i always mention this thing that you know growing up in a village i didn't have access to technology in the growing years growing up years and i missed out quite a lot but uh, as soon as i got on to the online platforms there was like so much that i could do like you know even i didn't have to ask somebody to read out news what, what's the news even to see the time you don't have to go looking for a braille watch uh even when you take something a uh, simple like something so obvious like written communication that everyone has on a daily basis it was never possible for me till i learned to use email because till then if i had to communicate with somebody who can see it was verbally or uh, someone had to write it for me or i had to write it in braille which majority of the people don't understand now this actually compromises so much of what you have to say because if I, if i were to send a message and if i were to ask somebody to type it for me that means i don't have privacy what i want to say i cannot say it but digital uh, digital platforms have opened up so many opportunities and definitely have given a lot of uh, privacy to individuals with disabilities which we don't have mostly because someone or the other is always there and the more severe disability you have I, from what i have observed the lesser privacy you have um and as we know that a lot of people are not able to get on digital platforms are really good uh, as we all know they have enabled so much that was not possible before but definitely there are so many challenges in general for persons with disabilities like firstly the accessibility issues that we all generally talk about the websites are not designed in a way that people can access there are a lot of images lot of the things that are so obvious for other people i'm talking from a visually impaired person's point of view they are simply inaccessible because they're not labeled they're image based but when you talk about women with a disability the barriers are many too many uh from what i have observed you know it, it's an irony actually digital platforms as i mentioned they have given a lot of privacy at the same time you have to be so careful because um uh, when i started using a computer for example uh, i was not using lot of video calls it was not necessary for me but when the when covid happened and when people were trying to get on to online platforms then video calls were a must so for me first i assumed that in the computer the camera will be the whole of monitor that was my assumption because i did not know and then i would put my screen a bit down thinking that okay if i if i don't want myself to be visible i can put it down so that people are not able to see but once when my uh, sister took a look at it she she was just saying that the camera is just on top of the monitor and it's just your finger size if you put it down actually people can see you much more clearly so from then it's really difficult without taking a second opinion to do anything digitally because <laughs> you really don't understand you, you really don't know uh, if i feel that it i have too much vulnerability and i'm missing out a lot of things which the world outside knows so i feel like taking a second opinion for everything uh but once you learn the basics once you learn the game then it it will definitely empower you but at the same time uh something new would have come up and there'll be something that you're missing out compared to someone who can see for example so these are some of the constraints that i face on a daily basis and also one of the other issue is when you're using a screen reader and typing something sometimes it when you're in uh places where it's crowded so whatever it is reading for you it for example you know when it's reading uh b and d so you might not make out the difference and uh, you tend to send some other word instead of some other word 
or when we say voice communication that you'll have to use um sometimes it's it's really confusing because again there is no privacy when you're in a place when suppose i'm in a conference and i'm not able to type everything because it's touch screen when i'm trying to use voice based communication there's no privacy so all of these are there and and one of the main barrier that i have found whenever i have to join online in a lot of meetings everyone finds it whether you have a disability or not it's like you can you cannot type at least if there there's some other disability maybe typing may be easier if say you have a hearing impairment or things like that but if you have a visual impairment typing is a huge issue especially on phones but you cannot send out voice messages on uh, some of the whatsapp groups for example the ones that you have for visually impaired because the fear that someone will reach out to you and message you and things like that it has happened so many times in the past so though it is empowering it's still restricting and it's not empowering in in the true sense actually so these are like contradicting points but um, but this is the reality this is what happens with uh, most people Thank you very much, uh, Vidya. There's uh, so many different experiences that you have explained to us, and uh, and that's so important to uh, to understand uh, what a person with a disability goes through um, in uh, in becoming more and more uh, becoming more and more online and uh, becoming more active online. Um, I'd like to uh, tell a story about um, a young woman in Malawi, in Africa. Uh, she um, she was just as Vidya uh, supposed to be here, but unfortunately there were visa issues and so forth. Uh, and uh, through the a sister. Um, dynamic coalition on accessibility and disability uh, we have provided travel support uh, for um, uh, persons with disability to participate here at the IGF and and um, and uh, I'd like to explain about Grace Salange from Malawi uh, she uh, is a wheelchair user uh, she has a speech impairment and she has limited use of one hand, but uh, and she comes from a poor family in a village. But uh, she was determined to uh, to study uh, IT, and uh, and so she went through school. She went to vocational college, and uh, and she she got through that uh, with uh, uh, very well. And and now she uh, she is sometimes tutors other students, and the way she uses um, a smartphone or a um, a laptop is with her knuckles. That's the way she can communicate with uh, with her uh, digital tools, and and what is. What is important when a when a person with a disability is online? Who knows? W there's there's no there's no like um, oh they're different or or something like that. We are together a digital being, and and that is important that we are then feeling like we are on the same level with anybody. We communicate in the same way uh, on superficially, even though there might be tools that are needed. But the recipient of an email or a text wouldn't know that. And, and I think that's very important. But obviously, those tools, they need to be there. They, they need to be workable. Uh, they need to, to be designed with accessibility in mind. So we're talking about tools in a general sense. We're talking about um, websites uh, based on the uh, international guidelines, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines through W3C. 
Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, making sure that apps are accessible, and it's so important when any any tool, any e-learning platform, anything is developed, that it's done together with persons with disability. So there is that saying in the disability community, nothing about us without us. And, and that is, is part really of digital self-determination, that we as persons with disability are able to be part of a development, of part of the community as such, and we are respected for that. So I, I, I just wanted to pass back to, to Vidya to um, talk a little bit uh, about uh, some of the privacy and security issues, because we can imagine that um, as a person with a vision impairment, uh, there are additional concerns about privacy. We all have concerns about privacy and security, but there might be some additional factors that uh, Vidya can explain to us. Thank you. Uh, yes, actually, digital tools enable you to do a lot of things by yourself, which was not possible. For example, these days, um, there are a lot of color recognizers, there are if you have if you have a currency there are apps which can tell you what the currency is about then there are um, apps like be my eyes you know be my eyes is a, an online app which uh, visually impaired people can install on their phones and persons who can see uh, sighted people can sign up as volunteers so if you want any help suppose you're not sure if the light is on or not. And the, one of the huge constraints that we have is uh, solving CAPTCHAs. CAPTCHAs are designed for um, not being readable by machines so that the internet is, n the privacy is not compromised. Uh, but these can be uh, huge barriers for persons with visual impairment, especially when you don't have audio capture. The, the, it, it can be very frustrating because though you know how to use a computer, you cannot use it. So though you, you can navigate the website, actually you cannot without taking help. And always there will not be somebody around you. But if you use tools like these, you can any time, any part of the day, of course, there's a, there's a constraint that if you know English, then any part of the day, you will get uh, somebody to assist you. Even if you don't know English, uh, you can set up your local language. Whoever is volunteering can set up their language as the local primary language and can assist in that language. But for example, in India, we have a language called Kannada. So if I want to get help in Canada, then uh, I will not get a lot of users in the in Indian time, night time, because obviously Canada speaking population uh, for them morning is uh, Indian time morning. But if you know English 24 hours, there'll be someone to assist you. But really, sometimes I take, I use these tools because you cannot expect someone to be always around with you and you need quick help. Uh, one of the things is that always people also may, may not be w uh, willing to help you or even if they're willing to help you, they may not have the time. So these tools are, are very good actually because you can call and you can ask them. In fact, I conducted a lot of digital literacy trainings and uh, uh, as I'm working with school teachers. Uh, so I actually guided them on installing these apps and taking advantage of them. We found really good uses, you know, apart from the CAPTCHA example that I told you. So how it works is you can call them and uh, the volunteer who picks up the phone will tell you to take the phone and uh, point it to the computer. Now, if you're blind, you may not know whether the CAPTCHA is visible or not. So they'll tell you move right or move down. Now I can see it better. Now I can tell you. But, uh, you know, the, when I conducted these trainings, teachers, actually the women teachers, found innovative use of those technologies. In fact, somebody was using it to uh, match their dress, uh, we call it sari in India, with bangles. So whether the color is matching. So these are some of the innovative, but these were very much needed for the teachers um, whom we are working with. And they started finding these uh, tools very helpful. But now talking about the privacy concern, it's like 
you don't want to depend on somebody too much uh, because they're not there or they may not have the time but you're forced to depend certain times and and at the same time you're very concerned about about where you're pointing the camera towards whether it is safe whether you don't know what's happening who is picking it up uh, you just know you can just know the voice but you don't know what data is being collected for example there will be uh, just take for example banking transaction now at the end of the transaction if you have to enter your captcha it means you have to enter all the details in the beginning itself before showing before pointing your screen towards the computer which means the person who is at the other end can figure out what you have typed so that is a huge compromise actually i mean people have well intention but at the same time it's huge compromise you're not very sure but if you were to enter the captcha in the beginning itself and then type your data then it will time out so the captcha will have only 40 seconds or a minute by then you have to enter and submit so that kind of privacy concerns are there and the privacy concerns about how much of you should be visible to the other person where are you pointing your camera whether it's safe whether whether you're very unsure actually like apart from the voice you're not sure of what's happening so these issues uh, are there specifically for uh, women with a disability and even on simple platforms which everyone uses on a daily basis like facebook instagram all of, all of these we talk about accessibility issues those are definitely there but for example now if i if i were to upload uh, all the photos that i have uh, i have taken during this conference if i have to make a blog or if i have to put all of these on facebook now what i do is i generally tell somebody to so my cousin has come with me he's going to give me the photo with the caption but that's all information i have now i don't know whether i want those photos to be there or not because you're not seeing them in the true sense right you're just depending on the caption and sometimes you might miss it there may be four or five pictures and there may be one uh, caption that is there always there won't be somebody to give you those captions so always it is risky because sometimes people have told me only half of your face is visible or this photo shouldn't have been there um and everyone so much relies on visuals that sometimes you're forced to take screenshots and share and then you really have no idea of what you are sending so these concerns are there they are very empowering at the same time all of these concerns are there you just need a second opinion most of the times thank you very much uh vidya there was um a lot of uh, very good examples there of uh, particular privacy and security concerns uh, we did have some technical issues with the zoom link and uh, and i'm very pleased to say that uh, our online speakers are nearly all there so um we we are switching back to uh, the introduction to Deborati Das who will um explain a little bit uh, about the uh, the project uh, in India when it comes to uh, this particular topic so um over to you Deborati Hello everybody <coughs> sorry there was some technical issues and some uh, confusion with the link uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining i am debarati from point of view and uh, we are a feminist non-profit in india uh, working primarily in the intersections of gender sexuality disability and technology uh, so to set uh, some more context for this uh, session today um, as our digital footprints grow every day we are really grappling with uh, new concepts new experiences and understandings of the relationships uh, between our lives and the technologies that we use and it's become really important to understand who we are as digital beings what does the self mean in uh, data driven digital spaces and how do we imagine things like autonomy agency choice in uh, today's age of datafication so digital self determination 
is an evolving concept to consider some of these uh, critical questions. And it fundamentally uh, affirms the fact that a person's data is an extension of themselves in the cyberspace. And we need to consider how individuals can have autonomy over our digital selves. So today we'll unpack some of these uh, very critical questions through the lens of experiences of persons with disabilities from different countries and regions. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our um, moderators. Uh, sorry about the delay uh, because of the technical issues. Our moderator on site is uh, Gunella Asprink. Gunella has been very active in the disability policy programs and research for 30 years and uh, chairs the Internet Society's Accessibility Standing Group. Uh, and has also served on the um, IGF's multi-stakeholder advisory group and is the vice chair of ICANN's um, Asia-Pacific Regional at-Large Organization. Our moderator um, online and our partner in this is uh, Padmini Ray Mare, who is the founder of Design Beku, a design um, and digital collective that is based in Bangalore, uh, India, that works to shift how we can think about design and tech as processes of co-creation and participation um, centered around feminist values, design justice principles, and ethics of care um, that advocate uh, also for uh, you know, designing with communities and not for communities. Uh, with this, I hand it over to Padmini to uh, maybe share in brief a bit more context of how today's uh, topic relates to disability rights and justice. And then over to you both, uh, Padmini and Gunella, to take the conversation. So, uh, yeah. Please, yeah, good. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Devarati. Uh, it's nice to be here, albeit uh, virtually. So I think um, actually, Vidya, the first speaker, has already kind of set the scene um, quite well because uh, I think, as um, they mentioned, that uh, digital self determination, of course, is something that we are all. Um, at the kind of currently positioned in a way that we all have to think about quite deeply because of the implications of uh, surveillance capitalism. Uh, every single device we use is compromised by some form of uh, surveillance. And uh, it is very difficult for even non-disabled people to wrap their head around the implications of being online, using these devices, and thinking about uh, how to keep themselves um, there and their privacy safe. And I think um, obviously this is uh, this burden is doubled for people with disabilities. Uh, there are two reasons for this, um, largely because uh, most devices or apps, even if they are made for um, disabled users, might not be taking these uh, concerns into consideration when they're being designed. Uh, so some of our work over the last uh, few months with uh, point of view has been actually speaking to designers and technologists and putting them in conversation with people with disabilities so that they can understand their needs better because I think something that we all kind of come across when designing technologies is that while there are accessibility guidelines, for example, those set forward by the W3D, those are often just a baseline and um, there is much more uh, nuanced requirements of uh, disabled users that need to be taken into account. I think the second um, issue is that uh, in any kind of case uh, around privacy and surveillance, it is always ma the marginalized who are the most vulnerable and um, there is often the least uh, kind of opportunity um, and options for recourse for them. And so it becomes even more important that we look specifically at um, disabled users and how they might be able to pursue self-determination as a use case. So I'll just stop there and I'll hand back to Gunella. Thank you very much, Padmini. And uh, just, just for those um, uh, participants and speakers online, uh, we did start uh, uh, half an hour, over half an hour ago. So it means we have about 25 minutes left. So we, we will um, move on to, uh, to talk a little bit about, um, let's see, we're going to talk about imagining digital tech that works for everyone. And so I'm, I'm keen to hear examples and stories 
of uh, digital tech that provides accessible, safe, joyful user experiences. So if Manik Gunaratna is online, uh, I'd like to pass um, the floor over to her. Manik Gunaratna is um, uh, the manager of the Specialized Training and Disability Resource Center of the Employers Federation of Salon. She has promoted inclusive economic development centering on persons with disability. And she also acts as a vice chairperson of the South Asian Disability Forum and is a founding member of the South Asian Women with Disabilities Network and a member of the Asia Pacific Women with Disabilities United. So um, if uh, Manik is there online, uh, please go ahead and talk about how, how digital tech, uh, how it can be the best we would like it to be. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gunela. Uh, yes, uh, the technology is very important uh, for people with disabilities because that's how we survive in the uh, society. Because we as people with disabilities, we have a disability which we have to admit. So through these assistive devices and technology, we, uh, we it's easy for us to uh, work equally capable as people with uh, non-disabilities. And also, uh, what are the, imagine, if we imagine a world of technology uh, which will assist people with disabilities, for example, right? If there is a world where uh, the technology through the movements of people with disabilities, which they can inform the caregivers, what the requirements of the person with disabilities, then the lifestyle would be very uh, easy for us. And especially with now with the AI, artificial intelligence, AI technology, there are so many technologies available, but the problem is the cost factor. So it's uh, very important that uh, they have, because for example, for hearing impaired persons, if someone comes, uh, say if a, <clears throat> someone rings the bell, hearing impaired persons cannot hear. Or if a dog barks, a hearing impaired person cannot hear. But when the technology is there, or through a smartphone or any device, if a dog is barking, a picture can be provided a dog barking, or when, a do when the doorbell is ringing. Uh, through the smartphone, if uh, they can indicate that the doorbell is ringing. So it will be very easy for vision, uh, hearing impaired uh, persons uh, to uh, make life easy. And also for vision impaired persons, the smart glasses, uh, right? Uh, if we are through the uh, eye gestures and when we walk with the smart glasses, uh, if we can identify what is uh, around us, and give a description so it will be very easy and also uh, for people with physical disabilities they are the people who have the mobility difficulties so through apps and technology if he, they can find out places which they can access it may be a restaurant it may be a movie theater so those things are uh, important and also there are people with disabilities where their movements are limited so through hand gestures and facial expressions, if they can operate the computer, they also can be equally uh, capable as people with non-disability so that they can be, uh, be employed and economically acti active. And also if there may be technology through brain functions and the way of thinking, if they can operate any devices. So those are very important and also Entertainment is not only for people with non-disability. We as people with disabilities also uh, need entertainment, maybe playing games through smartphones and over the computers. So any accessible uh, games and technology, uh, this uh, it's very important. And also if technology is there to uh, give emotional recognition. People with autism and also uh, uh, people with intellectual disability that would be very grateful for them and platforms which are accessible so that all of us can equally uh, use platforms uh, which are accessible and if we can imagine of a world where a smartphone sorry smart home 
if you want to cook something, if you put all the ingredients and press the buttons and say, we, I want fried chips or uh, anything, cooked rice, whatever, if the uh, end product is there. So for people with disabilities, the home can be very smart. So, and we, as people with disability, use a lot of device, uh, devices. I'm a vision impaired person. If you can just imagine a world full of darkness around you, and that is my world. So we do work equally capable as people with non-disability through various apps, the smartphones, the laptop, and we use the Be My Eyes app, which uh, gives assistance for us and smart, uh, currency identifiers, color recognizers. A lot of apps are available through the smartphone and other devices. So world with full of technology, especially for women with disabilities, is very useful for us. Thank you so much, Manik. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, all of those technologies were available so that persons with disabilities could live seamlessly and uh, independently, and uh, that's what we are all aiming for. Um, I would like now to ask uh, Judy Okita, if she is online, uh, to, uh, to speak a little bit uh, to this particular imagining topic, but also talking generally about uh, her experience of uh, uh, accessibility and potential barriers. And Judy Okita is from Kiktonet in Kenya and is the founder of the Association for Accessibility and Equality. And she's been advocating for many years for better access for persons with disability, both in regard to physical infrastructure and online content. So um, I'll hand over to Judy, please, if she is there. Hello, Gunella. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, it's, it's an interesting topic that we talk about um, accessibility to for persons with disability. And yes, I will be excited to see uh, all inclusive technology or, or inclusive, um, you know, uh, physical spaces, uh, because that's the one that really affects me the most. I, I know for a, a long time, uh, we've been advocating for, for physical accessibility, even within the IGF. Uh, I hope that this year it's much better. And the little things that um, we don't get to think about, we don't get to um, look into are what really um, brings the barriers and so enables uh, or rather uh, puts the people into the spaces of you have to request for, for assistance every now and then. So one of the things that uh, uh, probably I'll just mention that we have been able even to do with Kiktonet in this year um, we were able to evaluate the government websites. Um, we, we did that on 46 websites, um, just to be able to see the access, how accessible this information for persons with disability is. Um, unfortunately, the highest was um, got an 80%. Of course, we were using the poor uh, principles and it was interesting, um, the feedback. The feedback from government was, was interesting because uh, people felt if you are at 80%, then you, know, you are at a good space. But no, if you're at 80%, that means 20% of your content is not accessible, meaning that your content is still not accessible for persons with disability. Another thing that we, we, we found um, from the research that we did was that more emphasis is placed on um, the persons who are blind when it comes to um, digital content. But you will find that a person with cognitive disability is actually more disadvantaged. If um, the content is not um, understandable, if the content is not perceivable, then you've lost this person. They are not going to be able to interact with your information as much as you'd want all of them to. 
and, and looking at it from the Kenya perspective, it's only a few years, maybe two years ago, that the cognitive um, disability was recognized as actually as a disability. Then you can see how far we still are um, on inclusion, on ensuring that everyone is, is included. So I would really um, like to see if there are these little things that we can ensure that the persons with disability are part of our of our change. Yes, we want to make change, but we need to include them, not because they want to, but because they have to be part of the process. If I can just quickly um, give an example. Uh, most recently, I was in, um, in Dar es Salaam, in Tanzania. We were having the forum uh, for freedom in, in Dar es Salaam. That is an annual event. Um, and we've worked with them before, so they know my very specific um, needs when it comes to the physical uh, platform. So when I got there, um, they had the ramp, yes, but there is the big pavement before you get into the ramp. So my question was, um, how does this make sense? So yes, there is the ramp, but I will still need to be lifted up to get to the ramp. So that's not the access that we are talking about. Um, they had a really beautiful accessible um, room, but uh, they have this very small cubicle for the, um, for the washroom. So I, I decided that this time around, I'm not going to say much about it. I'm just going to demonstrate. So I had to call the guys um, from the reception and I was like, could you please come upstairs with, you, with the wheelchair? Is there a wheelchair? So they were like, okay, yes. So they came to the room with a wheelchair and I requested them, could you please uh, push the wheelchair into the bathroom? You know, and, and the guy is asking me, how do we do that? I'm like, that's an excellent question. How would you expect me to use it if you cannot push it uh, in there? So it's not that the persons with disability want to be part of the process. They have to be part of the process. We need to empower the persons with disability to really uh, be able to know their rights. You know, I mean, I have the right to say this is not working for me. It, it's not for you to tell me, no, this is the accessible room. People use it. No. I tell you, if it is not accessible, then it is not. And I just kept telling them, if you had included a person with disability to be part of this process, the ramp would not have been this bad. I mean, the washroom would not have been this bad. It's not about having a wide, beautiful room. It's about having it accessible. So I would really love to see if we can um, do that and be deliberate in that it's it's not something that we are requesting it's a right we need to be to be part of that we need to be part of the move of of the change it's it's not about um we are going to disturb them or we know what it is that they need it's about ensuring that they are part of that process that they are there that they have a yes or a no and we we are able and we are ready to listen to the yes and no and to make those necessary changes. Thank you very much, Gunella. Thank you very much, uh, Judy. And I think it just shows that uh, we have this, this beautiful imagining of what uh, accessibility is and, and what technology can do. But then we come to Earth and realize some really fundamental things still need to be fixed. And I think Judy also made suggestions there about nothing about us without us. We need mm -hmm. to be involved in those, uh, those decisions on how something is built, if it's in the built environment or in the online environment. So uh, I, I now just wanted to um, ask the audience if there were any any particular questions, comments, and and first of all, um, Padmini, are there any online questions or comments uh, before we go to um, any in the room? 
Uh, so actually, uh, Gunella, since um, we just managed to get Nirmita in the room, it would be really nice uh, if we could also um, include her uh, in the conversation. Uh, so I think you might have a brief biography for her, but um, Nirmita is a kind of widely um, respected and unknown specialist in disability rights and uh, policy uh, from India. And so Nirmita, maybe we could have, since we're running a little short of time, uh, sure. just, um, skip to the question, which is that, uh, how do you feel um, policy and regulatory processes can kind of ensure the inclusion of um, disabled people in the creation of or the making of technologies, just like Judy was suggesting. Yeah, uh, so uh, first of all, apologies for coming late. Uh, I was facing some technical issues. So uh, let me get to the question. I think it's important to have policies because otherwise um, it, 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 it ensures that people are aware that uh, there is a need, it is mandated, it is recognized by law, there are standards to comply with, otherwise it is just a, a personal request of somebody to somebody, right? And, and the fact that there is a legal and a social requirement and a responsibility to comply with standards, uh, I think that is very important, um, you know, to ensure that accessibility is there uh, where, we, where we see. So if you look at the DARE Index survey, it shows that countries which have policies are more likely are, uh, you know, to have accessibility implemented. And uh, so starting from the policy, I think I would like to say that now we, having had, uh, have either we need to have policy or where we have policy, we need to focus on implementing the policy. And that gives us guidelines on what to do, how to do, and uh, where all to do. So I, I think that answers your question in brief. Can I just uh, very quickly add a follow-up question, which is that how would you advocate um, disabled people lobby for this kind of policy? Because it's quite labyrinthine, right? Like getting these questions to a policy level. So if you can just maybe share an example or maybe advice as to how that might be done. Sure. So, see, I think by and large, a uh, lot of countries have implemented the CRPD and are, uh, you know, uh, have ratified and signed and are implementing it in their legislation. But clearly, domain-specific policies uh, have to come from within, and persons with disabilities have to do that. It also depends on, you know, different strategies and different um, situations. For example, in India, when we had to lobby for the global and the national level copyright law, we we sub you know we did a whole lot of research on what what are the legal models available everywhere. We ran campaigns. Um, we we had meetings. We had signature campaigns. We had you know whole whole kind of campaign stuff happening. On the other hand, when we look at uh, electronic accessibility, we 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 had meetings with the officials of the electronic and IT department, and and you know that's how we we worked with them to develop a policy. On the Another level, when we look, look at implementing the procurement standard in India, we, we worked again with the ministry, with an agency, and there were you know, nationwide consultations with experts and with different academic groups and industry on what, uh, on what the standard should be and how it should be implemented. But clearly, the one thing that is there everywhere is that we need to be involved and we need to be uh, motivated and get other people you know, to be responsible for this. It's, it's not something which is only applicable to us. It's something we want uh, the country as a whole to, you know, implement. And it, it, it depends on situation to situation, who, who the people are we are in touch with. Whatever it is, we need to be proactive and we need to be ready to do more than we think it's our job to do. Thank, Thank you very you much, uh, Nirmita. And I'm, I'm so mm -hmm. pleased that you... Uh, uh, got online in time uh, to make your comments on policy. I think they are so essential. Uh, so uh, I, I will now um, ask Lydia Best uh, to have a question or a comment, please. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to add my voice. And as we speak about nothing about us without us, therefore I would like to disclose that I am deaf and I use cochlear implant. And when we talk about the technology and how it empowers us, it does, but it also disempowers. And in this case, for example, when during pandemic, the situation happened when everybody has gone online on the telephone lines, um, Google Meet was 
an excellent tool where we could very easily connect with Vigeta. And while not perfect, we were able to communicate, mostly one-to-one. -one. Text messages also help. For deaf people, sign language users, uh, we know that we've got the um, WhatsApp, we video calls, we can use sign language, great. When we meet, and Zoom has been mentioned today, when we meet at Zoom meetings, usually it is multinational meeting because I'm representing European Federation of Hard of Hearing People and I work globally as well. And when it comes to accents being involved, automatic captioning unfortunately fails us. And often we are finding difficult to participate because we cannot follow what the discussion is about. Another issue is when the users are actually switching off the videos because the auto captioning, if it's used, is not correct enough. We need to support ourselves lip reading. And that causes a problem. We need to actually disclose as well that we actually need someone, everyone, to have their face shown correctly so we can follow. But the latest invention of Zoom is causing the biggest consternation. So Zoom has rolled out quite a few languages now in automated version. Great. Any user who is participating in the Zoom call can actually click the language they want. But do you know what happens? You suddenly have, say, someone using English language. Someone else wants to actually follow Spanish language. And suddenly, both of us see both languages suddenly showing up as the captioning. It creates massive confusion. And lately, we are forced back into using only human captioning in the international meetings because we cannot rely on the technology which actually disempowers us. Unless everybody uses just one language, usually it has to be English. So there are a lot of issues. And to me, this demonstrates the latest thing with Zoom, that Zoom did not work with persons with disabilities, with expert disabilities, and did not do the user research enough before actually putting this new feature out. And that's something that is really distressing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia, for those important comments. Uh, um, is there any last minute um, comments, questions from anyone else, please? And Padmini, is there any comments or questions online? Gunal, and this is Nirmata here. Is there a minute? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to add yeah. some more thoughts on previous discussions. And uh, when we're talking about nothing about us without us, and we talk about accessibility, and I, I just wanted to uh, quickly mention that I think increasingly we feel the need for mainstream products to be you know, more universally designed. I mean, even simple technologies around us that we can use. And what we need to understand is that just because it's accessible, it's not usable to everybody. There are uh, different levels of users and maybe somebody who's uh, an expert in technology can use something, but the, another person using the screen, same screen reader or same captioning or same technology cannot. And uh, we, need to, we need to have that user-centric um, approach when we are talking about accessibility as well. So yeah, with that, I just conclude. Thank you, Nemeta. I think that is um, a very good point to end on. And uh, I wish to thank all our speakers uh, online in the room. Uh, and again, um, we unfortunately didn't have our online speakers there from the beginning because of some technical issues with the Zoom links, but uh, uh, all the information is captured and, uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, point of view and everyone else uh, who have participated in this session uh, will have some very useful information to uh, take home when it comes to digital self-determination for people with disability and especially for the gender focus on this topic. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Gunella. Uh, would be great if Padmini, you could share uh, your concluding thoughts, comments. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, so yes, I think uh, one thing that as somebody who is uh, both identifies as a designer and technologist, I think the biggest challenge that we struggle with is the fact that when we design and develop technology, we always tend to do it at scale. And this means that much more um, nuanced and individualized use is much um, harder uh, to provide. And so I think this does require a kind of a paradigmatic um, shift in the way we think about uh, creating uh, customized products. And I think something like AI might actually be the way forward, but we need to be able to kind of layer um, user interaction in such a way that uh, individual users can toggle between different kinds of way of using and experiencing technology rather than foisting the same technology on everybody because that's not a tenable solution. So I would urge uh, those of you who are working in the field and of course uh, people with disabilities who are affected by this to um, you know, start those conversations and uh, advocate for kind of more individualized um, and customized experiences rather than um, something one size that fits all because we know very well it doesn't. Thank you. Thank you very Everyone. much. And, and Deborah Rati, I think we have finished then. Uh, so thank you very much for this session. And, uh, and I think we'll conclude there. OK. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.